Welcome, world, to another mini-sode of Nobody's a Nobody podcast with me, Mike McVeigh. This is the podcast where I talk to people that I find fascinating and believe that you might find them fascinating as well. Today's mini-sode is going to focus a little bit on books that I have read in 2020. These are books that have risen to the top for whatever reason. I've read approximately 165 so far this year, and these are the ones I think would be most interesting to hear about, maybe check out from the library, buy a copy, whatever works best for you. Uh, I do keep my list up on Goodreads, so if you want to see what I've read and how I've rated it, I'm going to go for through a few books specifically that I really enjoyed. I'm going to go with the chronological order of how I read them this year. Uh, the first book that I read was actually when I was in the hospital back in January, and it's by John Grisham. It's called The Guardians. It's about basically trying to solve a cold case where the wrong person got killed. Um, or at least that's what they're alleging. And it's just really good story. I think it's going to make a great movie if it ever makes it that way. Um, next book is actually a reread. I try to listen to this book once a year. It's, it was meant to be an audio book. It's called a knock at midnight inspiration from the great sermons of Reverend Martin Luther King jr. And it's basically a collection of his sermons and, there's just something so powerful to hear what he has to say back in the 50s and the 60s that is still relevant today. And it's not necessarily his most famous sermons, but they're really well done. And it's very inspirational to listen to, and I try to listen to that on a yearly basis. Uh, the next book is also a reread, but I hadn't read this one for a few years. It's by Max Berry. It's called Lexicon. And it's just kind of a really funny way of how words have power. It's a fiction book. <laughs> it's basically um, kind of, I don't really know how to describe it. He's actually one of my favorite comedic authors. He's very set to, has a lot of satire and a lot of um, extremes that just make sense uh, to me. But the description on Goodreads says, at an exclusive school somewhere outside of Arlington, Virginia, students aren't taught history, geography, or mathematics, at least not in the usual ways, and said, instead, they're taught to persuade. And it's a pretty cool story. Um, (laughs) uh, Definitely something you should check out. Um, This next one was one that is definitely not my favorite book that I read this year. But it's a very important book. It's called The 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about it is it talks about how war has taken place over the years. And it he does a good way of, of subtly moving in and weaving in and out of different stories of war throughout multiple continents, throughout multiple countries and uh, multiple uh, periods of time. And even though I don't always agree with his answers, he does a very good job of really breaking down the content of what how war has come to be and the lessons that can be learned from it. Another book I really, really enjoyed uh, was The Daily Show, um, an oral history as told by John Stewart, the correspondent, staff, and guest. In fact, uh, after listening to this book, um, it was made specifically to be an audio book as well. It made me really miss the John Stewart show. And this isn't necessarily because he was always making fun of people who voted uh, red um, as opposed to blue, but it was just brought back so many memories of how I intersected, how I've changed politically, um, how I've changed about a lot of theories in life that I used to hold to. And it wasn't... um, one of the probably biggest negatives towards it is that I can't just go back and watch some of the John Stewart shows in full, um, watch clips. And that has been very helpful to deal, especially with this year with 2020. And again, not necessarily because I agree with John Stewart politically as much as it's nice to see someone make fun of politics just because of how extreme things go. At least it is for me. I should say it that way. Uh, a book that kind of surprised me, um, everybody knows, or most people know me, I'm not really a huge uh, OU fan, um, especially when it comes to football. I'm from Texas, and I kind of chose Texas over OU because everybody told me how to choose OU when I was a kid. But the book No Excuses, The Making of a Head Coach by Bob Stoops 
and uh, Gene Wojcikowski um, is really well done. Rob Stoops goes over kind of his history of growing up and how he became a coach and ended up coaching the Sooners and even has an afterword in the book that was really inspirational. And Bob Stoops has always been a kind of a classy guy, regardless if you cheer for his team or not. And it was nice hearing his side of the story. And he didn't talk about X's and O's and about how to win this and how to do that. He talked about basically just life events and how they formed him and how it made, how he made decisions was not always based on X's and O's, but um, what it could ultimately be better in certain kind of ways. Um, <laughs> we talked about this episode, actually, just uh, this past episode with Aaron Bowlerjack, but Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murder- Murders and the Birth of the FBI by David Gran. Excellent book. It took a couple chapters to get into, but it reads like fiction. And the absurdity <laughs> of what happens in the book also reads like fiction. If you want to hear what Aaron has to say, it's much better diagnosis than I, but he recommended this book to me and I rated it. It's probably one of my top three books of this year. It was written in 2017. Excellent book. Uh, another book, I in, I think it was eighth grade, maybe it was seventh grade. My school required us to read Flowers for Algernon in our English class. And we didn't read the whole book, but we read a portion of it and i multiple times gone back to thinking about flowers for Algernon and Charlie and Algernon and just the story of this mouse who becomes smart and how they tested out on a mentally disabled man and the ups and downs of going from a low IQ to a high IQ, at least told to, to us by Daniel keys. And I had a chance to reread this book or read the book altogether. It was written in 1959 and it's amazing how many things <laughs> still hold true. Uh, this has to make it on my all time favorite book list uh, because it, it tells, I believe the depth, not just the happiness, um, not just the joy, but also the sorrow that comes with knowing more and being wiser or at least smarter. I really like the idea of these untold <laughs> of these oral history books. Uh, the Office, the untold story of the greatest sitcom of the twenty, uh, the two thousands, an oral history by Andy Green. Uh, not quite as good as the John Stewart Show one, but still really well done and does a great job of giving the behind the scenes of specifically the creator and how many times they considered canceling The Office. Uh, this was actually written March of this year, and I read it not long after that. Very very entertaining. If you didn't like The Office, you might not like it as much, but uh, for me, it was great. Uh, Another football book. It was written in 2017 by Bruce Arians, The Quarterback Whisperer, How to Build an Elite NFL Quarterback. I find the NFL probably one of my favorite sports to watch, not because of the athletes and all the different things that happen with them, but because of the coaches and how much coaches really make the game. And Bruce Arians has been one of my favorite quarterback coaches uh, ever since he was with the Steelers and probably even technically when he was with the Colts. Um, And I really enjoy hearing his perspective. He's coached some of the most famous quarterbacks in the NFL. He coached Peyton Manning, um, (laughs) Andrew Luck, uh, Ben Roethlisberger. He's, uh, coach Carson Palmer helped Carson Palmer become good again and now he's actually coaching Tom Brady down in Tampa and it's really really fun when he wrote it it was before he coached Tom Brady but it's just interesting to see how he talks about quarterbacks and uh, how he goes behind the game plan and um, another book I was very shocked by how much I love this book it was written two years ago by Jackie Jackie McMullen uh and a couple other co-authors, Rafe uh, Bartholomew and Dan Clores, called Basketball Love Story. And it does kind of a really sweeping history of basketball, um, going from college, high school, the um, Olympics, as well as the NBA, and covers things like Nancy Klein Lieberman. Um, It has interviews with uh, the players, coaches, executives, journalists, And just a really fun book. It definitely was something that was great to read in the middle of the pandemic. Um, As I said, I really love kind of these TV shows, people that brought to light things. And uh, Mike Rice or Mike Reese and 
Matthew Klickenstein um, wrote a book called Springfield Confidential, Jokes, Secrets, and Outright Lies from a Lifetime Writing for The Simpsons. And Matt R- Mike Rice has literally written for the show since the beginning. And <laughs> you can definitely hear The Simpsons humor in his voice when he reads the book. It definitely makes a lot more sense. And he covers some of the things that even the things like how the Simpsons aren't funny anymore and how they still jokes from the earlier episodes. He addresses some of those issues. And he also talks about what it means, what it means to have worked for the Simpsons for as long as he has and the different roles he's had. The next book was one that I've been, had been waiting to read for a long time. And I might have to go back and read this again next year. I might even buy this because it was such a great book. Uh, Daniel J. Levitin wrote a field guide to lies critical thinking in the information age. And this was written um, back in 2016. So this was something that um, really helps us understand how our brain works, uh, specifically with why people lie and how we're able to process some of that. Um, he published it back in the election season four years ago. And it's it's really cool uh, how he, he navigates. Uh, Levitin has written several really good books on these kinds of things. And I definitely recommend this. In fact, I recommend almost all these books. <laughs> a, another surprise book for me. I am not a fan of Demi Moore. Not because I don't appreciate the roles that she's taken on the movies and stuff. In fact, I applaud some of the things that she's done. But Demi Moore wrote a memoir called Inside Out. And she tells her story um, about how she grew up and the broken home that she came from or you know what we call broken home us privileged people and I know that sounds really bad I don't mean that in a smart way but she had a hard life and yet she did make something out of it and she talks about the areas of struggle that she's had uh, being married to Bruce Willis and Ashton Kutcher and I, I know some people reviewed it afterwards and really broke down on her in a very harsh and difficult way just basically um, bashing her for saying the real things that she struggled with but I found this really moving and it made me definitely have a higher affinity for her. Still not a huge fan of her acting, but a brilliant book in my opinion. All right. So Jocko Willink um, is known for being a Navy SEAL who has taken on books called like Extreme Ownership. And that book was okay for me. I wasn't a huge fan of it, but it, it was good. But I finally got a hold of his Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual And that was so much better than extreme ownership for me. He takes a little bit more clear cut examples and he tries to do step-by-step language to help us really understand what he's trying to teach us. It's not just theories. It's very much um, how to, and for example, he talks about one of his first training exercises for the seals, how everybody was doing what they're told, but no one was looking for the solution to the problem. And so one of the things that he incorporated is he accidentally stepped back to see the situation and he saw why they weren't looking at the right way of finding the problem. So um, he started implementing that and he, that was encouraged. And he talks a lot about uh, leadership and teamwork in this book and very, um, it, it's a book I'm going to have to add to my list of reading every year. Uh, in fact, this was when we published this year. I didn't realize this in January. Uh, another book I've reread, Relentless, From Good to Great to Unstoppable by Tim S. Grover. I don't remember how the... Oh, I do remember. I was listening to a podcast uh, where he was being interviewed, and he's most famous for being the uh, trainer for Michael Jordan, and he also has trained Kobe Bryant and Dwayne Wade, among many, many others. But Michael Jordan was the one that he really made the fame of where my, when Michael Jordan uh, beefed up after the Bad Boys Pistons beat up on him for so long, and... That change helped Michael Jordan become not just a great basketball player, but to lead his team to the six championships and become kind of the great one in basketball. Now, Grover is very intense, and there's some things I do not agree with at all language-wise, and I I think he goes to an extreme that really only a certain kind of people even have an opportunity to do. But his book is solid, and it is the kind of inspiration to kind of kick you in the butt and get you moving. So a book that my friend Jim recommended to me, it was written back in 2002, so almost 20 years ago. And that's sad that this is one of the older books on this list, Um, but it's called It's Your Ship, Management Techniques from the Best Damn Ship in the Navy. Yes, you heard me say that word. Oh my goodness. Uh, It's by D. Michael Abershoff. And I can't tell you how many leadership books I've read in my life, well over 500. Um, 
and not to mention other books that can be used for leadership, but specifically leadership books, well over 500. This is one of the best books because he always tells stories of how he practices the techniques instead of just telling you the techniques. Uh, I rip on John Maxwell a lot, not because it's not good stuff, but John Maxwell tells things like this is how you should be, but a lot of his stories can contradict each other. And part of that's because different people respond to different things, but this is actually in practic practical use. Uh, some people say, well, he's a little bit braggy and he's a little bit um, full of himself, but you don't become an admiral <laughs> in the Navy without, um, you don't become a, a great captain if you just settle for things. You you kind of have to work your way up. You have to have enough of an ego to get to that top rank. And he tells about the practices he maintained that worked and that some of them that spread over. So uh, very cool. Another book I read, not every year, probably every other year. Uh, it's by Stephen Pressfield. It was written in 2003 called The War of Art. And it's Break Through the bo Blocks and Win Your Inner Creative Battles. And this is a, oh man, it's it's the kind of salty inspiration you need. Um, I don't think he necessarily uses language in a negative way, but he talks about that resistance is our greatest enemy and how we fight resistance is how we're able to break through. Uh, it's a very quick book overall. It's only 168 pages, uh, the paperback version, and it's definitely one that you should read if you're doing anything at all uh, to resist against the world. All right, so this book, I haven't read the full book, and that's the only reason why I don't give it five stars, but I am planning on getting this book. Uh, Amazon, or sorry, Audible put out a thing uh, for books to try to help you sleep, and they have uh, Tony Shalhoub, the guy from Monk, um, and Marvelous Miss Meisel. Uh, he reads this book in a way that's supposed to put you to sleep, and it's called A Short Hit Account of the History of Mathematics by W.W. Rouse Bell. Uh, <laughs> this book was originally published in 1900 or before and I was listening to it to try to fall asleep but just hearing the equivalent maybe one or two chapters inspired me oh my goodness I was so excited when I heard it and I, I want to re read the rest of this book um, I never thought hearing the history of mathematics would be something fun but this one is and if you're into history of weird things um well, this is actually more engaging than you might believe for a history book written when it was. All right. Uh, so a couple books. Uh, I was in a book study this year on Johnny Cash. And one of the, once I got into the book study, it recommended a specific biography uh, by Robert Hilburn called Johnny Cash, The Life. And the book that we were reading used a lot of information from this book. So I went ahead and read that book because... I'm the kind of guy that reads the books in the footnotes and Johnny cash. The life is amazing. It really covers the rock and roll co coaster that he did of those highs and his lows, um, how he compared himself, how he considered when he was success, success as opposed to a failure. Um, I really can't recommend this book enough. Um, it's a Johnny cash is someone I didn't really know much about other than he wrote a few songs that were popular, but this is definitely a book, um, that talks about someone who fought stereotypes, fought um, ne needless oppression um, back when it was not nearly as cool. And I thought I put the other book on there, but there's, uh, it's like trains um, or Jesus trains and murder um, the uh, theology of Johnny cash. And it's good. If you're into the kinds of things of how to help move to a idea of dealing with people who are both, good and bad and do good things and bad things. That's really good for that. Um, I think it really is a book that's best in a book study kind of group. Uh, so hunger games, sometimes I love it. Sometimes I hate it, but they, Suzanne Collins wrote the first uh, prequel earlier this year uh, called the ballad of songbirds and snakes. And it tells the story of Coralina snow who ends up being kind of the bad guy in the Hunger Games trilogy. I know, spoilers. But this tells the story of him as an 18-year-old. And the events that happen that bring him into the Hunger Games as a, as a start. And it is probably the best written book Collins wrote in this whole collection. Um, 
you know, we always get scared whenever someone writes off <laughs> more things, but this is really well done. I have to say that I wish this book would have been written first before the Hunger Games because I would enjoy the Hunger Games a lot more having read this book first. So I will probably read the Hunger Games again next year, uh, the trilogy, and I'll probably read this one again first because it really gives some perspective. And I'm hoping that this is not the end. This is a great prequel, um, and prequels are always difficult to tell when you know how it's going to end ultimately. So a book I kind of surprised that I read, I guess, um, it was also written this year. I've been trying to make an effort to really read books this year. And it, uh, it was startling. It's only 50 pages. It was actually possibly the shortest, uh, non child children's book I read this year. It's by the Charles river editors and it's called the Tulsa massacre of 1921, the controversial history and legacy of America's worst rice riot. Um, I came to this book mostly because of the kind of the new celebration of Juneteenth that a lot of people started celebrating this year. And, you know, I've read and I've watched a lot of horrible things of talking about war and violence. Um, this book is not biased against one race or one group opposed to another. I believe it does a fairly fair job of representing the law enforcement, uh, the black people, the white people, and those caught in between. Um, I think it does a fair example of trying to explain some of the things that goes on. And it's, it is very heart wrenching. Um, again, kind of like, uh, the book regarding uh, flower moon, <laughs> except there's not any hope. There's no justice that seems to come out of it. And, you know, I promote Max Wings a lot. Max Wings was just around the corner where all this started, even though it was um, 99 years ago. And sometimes it's hard to deal with the bad parts of our history of where bad things happen. And this is a a very well-written book, um, 50 pages, but it tells me everything I need to know and really too much. Um, I don't think I'll be able to read this again, but it is a book I'm very glad that I have read. Uh, another book, I kind of breezed through this one, which I think that was a mistake. Um, and despite that, it was really good. Annie Duke's Thinking and Bets, Making Smarter Decisions When You Don't Have All the Facts. And it's just a really good way of explaining how after the fact, it's really easy to make the right choice. Um, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty, but this is 2020 this year. And think about how many things did not go the way as planned, how many goals and dreams. And so Annie Dukes really takes this kind of idea of how we can't always have all the facts. We're not always going to have all the statistics. And for someone like me, who's very um, interested in sabermetrics and how things go, and why we do what we do, sometimes you just have to make a decision with what you have. And Annie Duke goes through that and helps give some ideas of ways to continue doing that. Uh, a children's book I read, <laughs> or I call it a children's book, it's called One More Thing, Stories and Other Stories by B.J. Novak. And B.J. Novak might be best known from his uh, being an actor and a writer on uh, The Office, as I've referred to before, and it, it's just, a, it's a, it's a child's style book, maybe is a better way of saying it, but it's a lot of comedy. Um, <laughs> I just really enjoyed it. Uh, that's probably the easiest way of saying it. Uh, another book, now this is the first time I read the book, um, the audio book, and the I read the comic book series, the graphic novel series uh, a few years ago, but the Sandman uh, by Neil Gaiman and the, it's probably, I don't know, either Sandman or mouse is the best set of graphic novels out there. Um, one's based on complete truth. Um, the other's based on um, just a perspective of a guy who's just insanely brilliant Um so I guess for the fiction, I fiction Sandman's the best graphic novel series, in my opinion, and the audio version does not disappoint. All right. So I was in another book club and this was the first book we read and 
It's called Children of Blood and Bone, The Legacy of Orisha, Orisha uh, number one, by Tomi Adayame. And I apologize for messing that up. It's basically the story of Zaylee, um, as well as her nemesis and a friend. And it keeps on switching back and forth, kind of George R.R. R. Martin style. But possibly the best young adult book series I have ever come across. And it's also heart-wrenching. It's that you cheer, you cry, um, you get pissed off. Um, and it was written again for young adults. Uh, people would say, uh, in fact, a lot of people would say like it was Harry Potter. Um, if you like Harry Potter, you're like this. And I don't think that's a fair thing. I think if you enjoy good fiction, um, regardless of adults, uh, young adults, this is a book to read. Um, and the second book is really good as well. Uh, Children of Virtue and Vengeance and I highly recommend both these books. I'm looking forward to the third book greatly. Um, All right, so another author that I've referred to already, he wrote two more books that I (laughs) um, read, and they're written for children um, or for young, uh, for like uh, preteens. I mentioned Jocko Willink earlier, and he wrote the Tactical Guide. Um, He also wrote books for a couple books for kids called Way of the Warrior Kid. And uh, I can't remember the second book's name, but it's from Wimpy to Warrior, the Navy SEAL way. And there are some things about it where I don't know if I agree with everything, but man, it's inspirational. Even as an adult, I feel like he has a very good way of going at, going about life and there's no excuses. There's, um, I, I do believe there are excuses, <laughs> but I think that whenever we're trying to obtain a goal, it's very easy to get sidetracked. And this is kind of the way from a kid's perspective, it's written from, from the kid's perspective. And that part makes it really cool. Uh, My daughter recommended, well, I shouldn't say recommended. I asked her what her favorite musical was in the episode I interviewed her and she said, be more chill. And uh, since it was based on a book, I read books. I went ahead and checked it out and I read be more chill by Ned Vizzini. And, The book was decent, uh, not great, but um, then I watched the musical and I'm glad my daughter loves it. Um, (laughs) It is a fun, it is a fun kind of um, thing. It has to deal with being popular and what the price is. So I definitely understand its appeal to my daughter and many others, but it's not a bad thing to, to read. It's got some surprise twist in there, but very, it's fun. I don't know if I really want my daughter reading that kind of stuff, but I guess I can't protect her forever, right? All right, so a couple more Neil Gaiman books. Uh, Neil Gaiman books. Uh, the first one is called "Fortunately the Milk," and it's a story of a father who goes and gets some milk, and then tells his kids about um, how the the story of getting the milk. <laughs> Uh, This is written in 2013, and um, Neil Gaiman's just a very, um, very, I I just love his work. I don't think I've read anything of his that I have not enjoyed. And Neil Gaiman also has a book called The View from the Cheap Seats, which is selected nonfiction that he's written. Specifically, it was from forewords that he's written. Um, It's interviews, not interviews, sorry, like special speeches he's given at different events for different reasons. Um, but mostly forwards from books that other people have written. And I think it's always interesting for someone who writes all about non or writes a lot of fiction and stories and fantasy to hear his perspective of how he thinks and observes others. He is brilliant is the best word I can think of. I probably like this book more than most of the books he's written and this is the guy who wrote um, American Gods, and he's written uh, The Sandman, and he's written, um, <laughs> uh, oh goodness, my mind's going blank now. Uh, he's written Coraline. He's written um, several really well done comic books. Um, but this is just great. Hearing him talk over and over about people that's made an impact in his life, and I went and checked out several of the books based on just his forewords on them. He brought back the joy of uh, thinking about Douglas Adams, who's one of my favorite authors, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, So I I definitely recommend this book. Uh, I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, I mentioned Way of the Warrior Kid. That second book was called Way of the Warrior Kid, Mark's Mission. 
And it's just a continuation of some other things and how his life's changed and how it can continue to change. So definitely recommend those uh, Way of the Warrior Kid books, um, even though I don't necessarily agree with everything that Will Link talks about it, but overall, very good. Uh, re- rewriting a book. It's the third time, fourth time I've read this book. Uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. This book was written all the way back in 1985 and talked about how TV... Um, became more of a distraction than as a source of education. Now he is perfectly fine with television being an understanding of entertainment, but he wants to argue that we need to always realize that the TV does not have a good purpose outside of entertainment. And he breaks it down through lots of different things. And he, uh, because he wrote this before personal computers were available, he said, some people said the computer will be like this as well but I can't deal with what's not here yet. And he does this really cool comparison between 1984 and uh, Brave New World and talks about uh, the difference between Huxley and uh, Orwell and how the world has been. And I think it's a very accurate book, though it would be interesting to see how he talks about things now in 2020 with the same thing. Unfortunately, he did die uh, several years ago. So really good book. Um, it, it has aged a little bit, but it's still important. Another book, I really was kind of surprised. I, I One reason I'm able to read so many books is I do use Audible. And I use the public library and I listen to a lot of books because I do a lot of driving for my job, um, when I go visit family, and honestly, even when I'm grilling or just walking around the block or whatever, I usually listen to a podcast or a book. And this is one that I've always been interested in hearing from Brian Tracy, reading his books, but it's never really come in my hands. And so this book goals, how to get everything you want faster than you ever thought possible. Now I don't agree with all of his results, but I do think some of the mindset of what it means to set goals is very important. And for me, the word goal is always like kind of a bad word. It's like (laughs) set goals. And I'm like, but I don't have any goals. And excuse me, Tracy does a good job of talking about goals in a way that I think is beneficial. Um, and how to make those goals, um, even for people like me who don't really like that word. All right. So this is a book that I actually came to because of, uh, watching the Andre, the giant biography on, um, HBO. It's called the squared circle life, death, and professional wrestling by David Schumacher. Um, (laughs) it's a four star book for me only because he glosses over so much stuff It was written in 2013. And I know it's very, very difficult. In fact, I wrote a review of this book in September. Um, very, very detailed. It talks about, you know, it's funny about professional wrestling. Everybody's like, you know, what's fake, right? And he said, yeah, everybody that watches professional wrestling, save maybe kids knows it's fake but it's not fake in the way that you think it's fake in the same way that people watch soap operas or watch the bachelor or watch uh, whatever the latest show on, you know, HBO or showtime is Um, wrestling is for a group of people. And it's not necessarily for uneducated people. Sometimes it's just fun. The personalities involved. Um, I think he needs to expand on this book and he needs to write a few more books to cover some of the areas he lightly glossed over, but a very good introduction to wrestling, especially if you aren't familiar with very much of it. Another book I read, it's a quick book. Well, it's 224 pages, but it's a quick book. It's a uh, blue fishing by Steve Sims. It's the art of making things happen. And here's a guy who basically got famous by helping other people, um, get what they wanted. And he does a good thing at the end of each chapter of kind of talking about how he get, what his goals are and how, actually not what his goals are, but what we need to do to um, make things happen. And so that, that's actually nice. I don't normally like that at the end of chapters, but he does it in a way that doesn't seem condescending and doesn't seem kind of fluff. It's, it's really good ways. Um, all right, so <laughs> this book I was waiting for for so long. Um, I'm a, I've become a big Timothy Zahn fan. Timothy Zahn is most famous in my world for writing um, a set of Star Wars books dealing with the villain Thrawn. And he wrote a series um, that ended last year that uh, it's a trilogy. And 
oh my goodness, it was so good. Uh, it actually got me into reading Star Wars books. Uh, my friend had been trying to get me into it for a while. And I got to meet Timothy Zahn last year and very humble dude. Um, I think Thrawn is possibly one of the most intriguing, best villains out there in fiction. I don't know of another villain um, that is as cool um, as intricate. He's one of those guys that you don't want to be, that you want on your side, but you definitely don't want him to be on the other side. And um, it's not because he's brute force. He's just very observant and he remembers but this book is called Chaos Rising. It's Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy, Ascendancy 1 uh, by Timothy Zahn. He just wrote that this year. Um, came out September 1st. In fact, I stopped other books that I was reading just to read this. <laughs> uh, to, went back to them. It's the first prequel book. Um, looking so forward to the next book. Hopefully, I don't have to wait too much longer, even though this only came out two months ago. Um, all right, so a book that just came out... Has it really been out for two months? Goodness, uh, it seems so long ago. Uh, but it, I thought I just read it a couple days ago. But I read it right after uh, Thrawn. Um, it's from Jared Bias, Love Matters More, How Fighting to Be Right Keeps Us from Loving Like Jesus. And Jared Bias uh, is the co-host of um, the Bible the Bible for Normal People podcast with Pete Inns. And this is maybe not his first book. It's one of his first books, though. And he talks about the culture he grew up from um, talks about how much people talk about following Christ, but don't necessarily live lives like him. And that we're more concerned with being right than loving um, like Jesus. And even if you're not a Christian, um, maybe especially if you're not a Christian, this is a book that where we're trying to say, Hey, we've screwed up in the past and there are better ways. Um, he does not speak in a condescending tone. He's very, um, it resonates a lot with my life and how I've seen things to be, but, um, I recommend it a very decent book. Um, it's by, uh, Zondervan. It's pretty short. It's 224 pages. Oh goodness. I only got two more books. I'm going to mention right now. Three more books. Um, another book I finished, uh, call sign chaos, learning to lead by Jim Mattis and Francis J being West jr. Um, from other friends, I was told how great Mattis was as a general. And this is a story from his own perspective of how he does and did what he did. I was reading an article and it was talking about some books that, um, had just, that are just very, very decent and I clicked on one of the books and found out this guy wrote four books and this is the first of the four. It's called before the storm, Barry Goldwater and the unmaking of the American consensus by Rick Perlstein. This was written back in 2002 and it talks about how the 1964 election it's, it's the lead up to the 1964 election and where the United States was at the time. And for me, this is really good to hear. It was good to read. Uh, it's about 700 pages. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoyed is a lot of times when I hear about the sixties, especially the early sixties, it's always this positive, like everything was perfect. Why can't we go back to the sixties? And it's nice hearing that life was not always easy. I mean, we know this in one sense, but sometimes we forget um, all the things that were going on, all the crises. All right. So the last book I'm going to mention is the inner game of tennis. The Classic Guide to the Mental Side of Peak Performance by W. Timothy Galway. And I'm only about 25% into the book or so. No, I guess I'm 40% into the book. Wait, hey, good, good for me. And I'm already buying the paperback of this uh, to have in my collection permanently because a lot of what I do and the way I think, I'm really str I really struggle for certain kinds of results. Uh, in fact, <laughs> something that's crazy. I recorded a whole podcast last night and it's about, it was only about 10 minutes, but I wrote out a speech basically to give and it was okay. I listened to it and I was ready to publish it tonight. Um, tonight being Wednesday, October 21st. But then as I slept on it, as I thought about stuff today, I knew it wasn't right, but I really wanted to put out an episode and, and I didn't know what to talk about. And then I thought about, and while listening to this book today, it talks about 
how we tense up when we know it's showtime. And even though it's geared specifically for tennis, it's not just about tennis. It's about life, how we, we choose to perform, how we, our initial uh, feelings are towards that. So again, I'm only about 40% through the book. I'll be through with it before the end of tomorrow. And I really have enjoyed it so far, unless this is a big waste. And if it is, I'll let you know next week, maybe. Um, but the inner art of tennis, I just said that wrong, didn't I? The inner game of tennis, pretty sure it's going to be one of the best reads of the year for me. So those were several books. Um, several of them were written this year uh, to go along with 120 or so that I didn't mention today <laughs> that I've already read and that I'm working on. Books are a lifeblood for me. In fact, I can think, I don't know how to imagine the world without all this free resource. When I say free, the library has most of these books. And ones they don't have for a fairly inexpensive price, for about $20 a month, I get two books and access to a whole other library of books that's not available at my public library. And I love books. I find that we can learn so much and in fact general mattis one of the things he he talks about how important reading is and that if we're able to learn from the mistakes of others and not repeat them in ourselves how much we have benefited how much we are able to move forward um, because we're not wasting our time making the mistakes others make and i agree with him Uh, reading is absolutely important they say that warren buffett and bill gates spend so much of their day every day reading to try to learn not just in their own fields but in other fields to just become more well-rounded and that's one reason why the book question has been a part of the interviews and probably oh i've got two or three interviews already pre-recorded I'll probably let those play out, but after those interviews, I will no longer have the questions at the end. Um, Maybe I'll have them at the beginning. What book are you reading right now that we should all read? Or what book have you read in the past year that we should all read? And I'll have the (laughs) the Harry Carey Donut question because that's just fun. Uh, But those won't necessarily be at the end. Maybe they'll be at the beginning. And I mention all these books because several of these people who wrote these books at the time they were kids I doubt most of them thought they were going to be authors who were going to impact my life and it's because of these authors and the thousands of others that I've read over my lifetime that have helped me become who I am and that I'm not a nobody and if you find the show inspirational or you find it encouraging it's because of books that have maybe realized other people have stories to tell. I know that's kind of, kind of cliche, right? But the stories that we tell, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, tell about us too. tell about what we need to do. All right. So I want to give one specific uh, shout out. It's not really to a local business or I guess kind of is, but it's me. Um, I wrote a book called Becoming Oaks a few years ago at the behest of several others and in fact, if you want to see if my writing appeals to you, you can go to MikeWMcVeigh.com and click on the Becoming Lo- Oaks cl- link. If you sign up for the mailing list, you can get a free chapter from my book. Uh, if you like it, feel free to buy a copy. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, or if I'm near enough to you, I can give you a signed copy or sell you a signed copy for not too much. And you're not a nobody. You're somebody. Until next time.